not incidentally, his levels of concentration, his overall mood are up. He's doing far, far better. Fortunately, most people do not experience or pursue enormous increases in dopamine leading to these severe drops in baseline. Many people do, however, and that's what we call addiction. When somebody pursues a drug or an activity that leads to huge increases in dopamine, and now you understand that afterward, the baseline of dopamine drops because of depletion of dopamine, the readily releasable pool. The dopamine is literally not around to be released, and so people feel pretty lousy. And many people make the mistake of then going and pursuing the dopamine evoking, the dopamine releasing activity or substance again, thinking mistakenly that it's going to bring up their baseline. It's going to give them that peak again. Not only does it not give them a peak, their baseline gets lower and lower because they're depleting dopamine more and more and more. And we've seen this over and over again. When people get addicted to something, then they're not achieving much pleasure at all. You even see this with video games. People will play a video game. They love it. It's super exciting to them. And then they'll keep playing and playing and playing. And either one of two things happens, typically both. First of all, I always say addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. So oftentimes what will happen is the person only has excitement and can achieve dopamine release to the same extent doing that behavior and not other behaviors. And so they start losing interest in school. They start losing interest in relationships. They start losing interest in fitness and well-being. And, and eventually what typically happens is they will stop getting dopamine release from that activity as well. And then they drop into a pretty serious depression. And this can get very severe and people have committed suicide from these sorts of patterns of activity. But what about the more typical scenario? What about the scenario of somebody who is really good at working during the week, they exercise during the week, they drink on the weekends? Well, that person is only consuming alcohol maybe one or two nights a week. But oftentimes that same person will be spiking their dopamine with food during the middle of the week. Now, we all have to eat, and it's nice to eat foods that we enjoy. I certainly do that. I love food, in fact. But let's say they're eating foods that really evoke a lot of dopamine release in the middle of the week. They're drinking one or two days on the weekend. They are one of these work hard, play hard types. So they're swimming a couple miles in the ocean in the middle of the week as well. Uh, they're going out dancing once on the weekend. Sounds like a pretty pretty balanced life as I describe it. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that dopamine is not just evoked by one of these activities. Dopamine is evoked by all of these activities. And dopamine is one currency of craving, motivation, and desire, and pleasure. There's only one currency. So even though if you look at the activities, you'd say, well, it's just on the weekends, or this thing is only a couple times a week. If you looked at dopamine simply as a function, as a chemical function of peaks and baseline, it might make sense why this person, after several years of work hard, play hard, would say, yeah, you know, I'm feeling kind of burnt out. I'm just not feeling like I have the same energy that I did a few years ago. And of course, there are age-related reasons why people can experience drops in energy. But oftentimes what's happening is not some sort of depletion in cellular metabolism that's related to aging. What's happening is they're spiking their dopamine through so many different activities throughout the week that their baseline is progressively dropping. And in this case, it can be very subtle. It can be very, very subtle. And that's actually a very sinister function of dopamine, we, we could say, which is that it can often drop in imperceptible ways, but then it, once it reaches a threshold of low dopamine, you just feel like, hmm, we can't really get pleasure from anything anymore. What used to work doesn't work anymore. So it starts to look a lot like the more severe addictions or the more acute addictions to things like cocaine and amphetamine, which lead to these big increases, these big spikes in dopamine, and then these very severe drops in the baseline. Now, of course, we all should engage in activities that we enjoy. I certainly do. Everybody should. A huge part of life is pursuing activities and, and things that we enjoy. The key thing is to understand this relationship between the peaks and the baseline and to understand how they influence one another. Because once you do that, you can start to make really good choices in the short run and in the long run to maintain your level of dopamine baseline, maybe even raise that level of dopamine baseline and still get those peaks and still achieve those feelings of 
elevated motivation, elevated desire and craving. Because again, those peaks and having a a sufficiently healthy high level of dopamine baseline are what drove the evolution of our species. And they're really what drive the evolution of anyone's life progression too. So they're a good thing. Dopamine is a good thing. Some of you might be asking, what should I do if I experience a drop in my baseline level of dopamine because of engagement with some activity or some substance that led to big peaks? Uh, Just to put some color and example on this, uh, a few episodes ago, I talked about a a friend who I've known a long time. This is actually the child of a friend who has basically become addicted to video games. He decided actually after seeing that episode with Anna to do a 30 day complete fast from phone, from video games and from social media of all kinds. He's now at day 29. He's really accomplished this. Not incidentally, his levels of concentration, his overall mood are up. He's doing far, far better. What he did is hard in particular the first 14 days is really hard. But the way that you replenish the releasable pool of dopamine is to not engage in these dopaminergic seeking behaviors. Because remember, typically people arrive at a place where they want to stop engaging in these behaviors or ingesting substances when that dopamine is depleted, when they're not getting the same lift. In his case, he was feeling depressed. He thought he had ADHD. They were starting to treat it as as ADHD. And certainly there are people out there who have ADHD, but what he found was that his levels of concentration are back. He does not need to be treated for ADHD. And actually the psychiatrist wondered if he did prior to this video game, social media fast. He's feeling good. He's exercising again. I'm not making this up. This is really a a very specific but very relevant example of how the dopamine system can replenish itself. Of course, if there's a clinical need for ADHD treatment, by all means, pursue that. But I think a lot of ADHD does go misdiagnosed because of this depletion in dopamine that occurs because of overindulgence in other activities and the drop in baseline. So for anyone that's experienced a real drop in baseline who has addictive tendencies, whether or not their behaviors or substances, that is always going to be the path forward is going to be either cold turkey or through some sort of tapering to limit interactions with the what would otherwise be the dopamine evoking behavior or substance.